All right, good morning, everyone. Welcome. I'm going to get started. We have another awards presentation at the end today. Um, so I, I would like to go ahead and introduce our speaker, Dr. Judith Sui, to speak this morning. Uh, she's an associate professor of general internal medicine at UW. She is board certified in both internal medicine and addiction medicine. She completed medical school at NYU, residency training at OHSU, earned her MPH from Emory. She has extensive experience in examining the intersection of substance abuse, pain, and related viral infections, notably the treatment of opioid use disorder and its impact on the prevention of hepatitis C. And it is with this background that she comes to us this morning to speak. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Sui as she presents addressing treatment gaps to overcome the crisis of opioid use disorders and hepatitis C. So thank you for that uh, kind introduction. It's really a pleasure to be here this morning to give Grand Rounds. I appreciate the invitation. So contrary to last week's announcement, I will not be presenting on the social determinants of health, so I apologize in advance for anyone who was expecting to hear that talk today. Um, so my talk is somewhat more narrowly defined. I'll be speaking about addressing treatment gaps to overcome the crisis of opioid use disorder and hepatitis C. So these are my financial disclosures, uh, which are mainly NIH uh, grant research support. I do want to note that there is one PEEP Corey funded study, the HERO study, which I'll discuss later, that does receive medications from Gilead. So the objectives of my talk today are to describe the epidemiology of the opioid, opioid crisis and its overlap with hepatitis C to review evidence that medications for opioid use disorder can prevent hepatitis C, to show research showing that medications for hepatitis C and opioid use disorder are underutilized, and describe some clinical programs that we have implemented at Harborview to, to address these gaps. And finally, I'll briefly describe some ongoing research to improve opioid use disorder and hepatitis C medication access and adherence. But first, I'd like to start with some patient vignettes. These are based on real patients that I've cared for over time, and these may be familiar stories to you as well. So TS is a 60-year-old man presenting for primary care. He has a history of experimenting with heroin as a young adult. In his 40s, he experienced a back injury and was then introduced to prescription opioids. He subsequently received high-dose opioids for chronic pain for many years and experienced medical consequences from that, including multiple hospitalizations for, quote, over-sedation, which I think we can now identify as being overdose events. His primary care provider discontinued his opioids and he subsequently lapsed to using heroin. He was started on buprenorphine a year ago and is doing well. He was recently diagnosed with hepatitis C. So CL is a 28-year-old woman seen in the emergency department for cellulitis. She has a history of childhood physical and sexual trauma and resulting PTSD. At age 13, she experimented with alcohol, cigarettes, and marijuana. At age 15, she was introduced to prescription opioids through a friend. At age 17, she started using heroin, at first snorting it, and with a year, she was injecting. She's had one prior treatment attempt on methadone, but self-discontinued. She's currently homeless, trades sex for money and drugs and she too has recently been diagnosed with hepatitis C. So as these vignettes demonstrate, we are currently witnessing a concurrent epidemic of opioid use disorder and hepatitis C. And how did we come to arrive at this point? So this slide demonstrates upward trends in opioid prescribing that occurred uh, from 1999 to 2010 and shows the nearly parallel trends in increased hospitalizations related to opioid use and overdose. 
The good news is that since 2012, opioid prescribing rates have peaked, but still remain high at nearly 60 prescriptions written per 100 persons. Also rates vary greatly by geographic region. One alarming statistic is that in 16% of US counties, enough opioid prescriptions were dispensed such that every person could have one. We conducted a study prior to 2010 that showed that among patients presenting for treatment for opioid use disorder, 29% reported that they were introduced to opioids through a physician's prescription. So there's now considerable national attention on the origins of the opioid crisis and the role that pharmaceutical companies have played in promoting the sales of chronic uh, opioids for chronic pain, as well as the role physicians have played in overprescribing. In addition, the increasing availability of heroin and diverted pharmaceutical opioids have greatly contributed to the opioid crisis. So the bad news is that although opioid prescribing peaked in 2012, deaths related to opioids are unfortunately still increasing. So this slide shows overdose-related mortality by gender, and as you can see, there is no slowing of deaths in recent years. If anything, there's been an increase in the rate around 2015, which is believed to be related to an increase in fentanyl availability which carries an extremely high risk for overdose. The other major consequence of the opioid epidemic that has emerged is the increase in infectious diseases related to injecting drugs. The first instance of this that caught the attention of the public eye occurred in 2015 when a small rural county in Indiana reported a cluster of 11 new cases of HIV an investigation eventually found 181 cases total, nearly all who were co-infected with hepatitis C, that were related to injecting a prescription opioid named Opana. Since that initial outbreak in Indiana, there have been subsequent outbreaks reported uh, in northeastern Massachusetts, and also here recently in Seattle um, by our UW faculty. As a consequence of the opioid crisis, there's been a shift in the epidemiology of hepatitis C with an increase in cases among young adults in rural areas, as recently reported in this paper, which was published in Clinical Infectious Disease in 2014. So the authors examined national surveillance data of acute hepatitis C cases between 2006 and 2012. They found that nearly half the cases occurred among young adults, and the majority of states reported an increase in 2012 compared to 2006. Of note, most cases were white and nearly half were women, which represents a shift in the demographics, as historically there has been a predominance of hepatitis C among non-whites and men. Massachusetts, the state where I practiced prior to moving to Seattle five years ago, has been very hard hit by the opioid epidemic. As a result, they have seen a shift in the age distribution of cases with hepatitis C as witnessed in this figure. In 2002, most of the cases were concentrated among middle-aged adults, um, i.e. the baby boomers. But in 2009, <coughs> we see a bimodal distribution of prevalence, with cases nearly equally distributed between young adults and the baby boomers. In Washington State, we have recently witnessed an increase in cases of hepatitis C as well, believed to be driven both by new infections in young adults, as well as increased diagnosis among baby boomers as a result of enhanced screening efforts in that group. These are data that were recently uh, reported in a story in the Seattle Times that also featured some quotes from some of our faculty. 
So we are now at a crossroads in time. The magnitude of the current opioid crisis and its infectious disease consequences have become abundantly clear. Yet we have tools in our armamentorium to overcome the crisis. So next I'll talk about medications for opioid use disorder and hepatitis C. So the good news is that we now have a number of different medications that are efficacious for treating opioid use disorder. Those medications include methadone, which is not new. It's been available since the 1950s. It is a full opioid agonist and is therefore highly efficacious, but has greater risk of side effects such as sedation and overdose. The other limitation is that it cannot be prescribed in an office-based setting for opioid use disorder, but it must be dispensed in a federally regulated opioid treatment program. It is usually dispensed as daily observed therapy, which can be viewed as both a therapeutic advantage and also an inconvenience to patients. Buprenorphine is a partial agonist approved by the FDA in 2003. It binds tightly to opioid receptors, but has healing effects such that patients experience less side effects, such as sedation and there is less overdose risk. Now, Trexone is an opioid antagonist and fully blocks opioid receptors with no opioid effects. Now, Trexone is available and mainly used as an injectable formulation, which was FDA approved for opioid use disorder in 2010. I should also add that buprenorphine is mainly prescribed as a sublingual medication, um, but injectable formulations have just been approved, but they are not widely used as of yet. Both of these medications, or all of these medications, <clears throat> have been shown in numerous studies, including randomized control trials, to decrease opioid craving and illicit use to reduce overdose and mortality, HIV risk behaviors, and HIV and hepatitis C incidents. So some quick comments about the language that I'll use um, when talking about medications for opioid use disorder from here on. I prefer the term opioid agonist therapy, or OAT, and I'll use that abbreviation in this presentation over opioid substitution therapy. Substitution, I believe, feeds into popular beliefs that methadone and buprenorphine are equivalent to, opioid use disorder, uh, to opioids. The other term which I prefer and I'll use in this presentation is medication treatment um, over the term medication-assisted treatment, which you may have heard. The term medication-assisted treatment to me reflects a bias against medications that's irrational. In fact, medications for opioid use disorder have been found to be the most efficacious treatments for opioid use disorder. And in fact, adding counseling to medications has not been definitively proven to have additional benefits. So there's a movement that we just call this treatment. So as a fellow at UCSF, I wrote a paper which demonstrated the benefits of opioid agonist therapy for preventing hepatitis C, which I'll review now. The study used data from the UFO study, which was an observational cohort of young adult injectors in the San Francisco area who were enrolled and followed between 2000 and 2013. Participants were hepatitis C uninfected, and were followed quarterly with surveys and hepatitis C viral load testing. We examined the cumulative incidence of hepatitis C by OAT treatment status and measured the relative hazards for hep C associated with OAT, adjusting for the covariates that you'll see there. So the sample included 552 participants who were followed prospectively for hepatitis C. The median age was 23, and most participants were white males who injected heroin. The majority reported no substance use <coughs> treatment, speaking to care delivery gaps. 
There were 171 new cases of hepatitis C that occurred over 680 person years of observation. We compared the incidence of new cases of hepatitis C among persons in four groups. Those who reported no drug treatment in the past three months, those who reported non-OAT, so that could be counseling or 12-step programs, those who reported detoxification, and those who reported maintenance treatment with opioid agonist therapy, and that could be methadone or buprenorphine. As you can see, the uh, incidence was markedly lower among the uh, OA group compared to the other groups. Adjusted Cox proportional hazards models demonstrated that maintenance OAT was independently and significantly associated with a lower relative hazards for becoming infected with hepatitis C over time, a, about a 60 percent reduction in incidence. A model was fit to examine mediation with adjustment for frequency of injecting, and that showed that the association became attenuated, suggesting that maintenance OAT reduces hepatitis C incidence in part by decreasing the frequency of injection. Adjustment for use of needle syringe exchange program had no substantive effect. Um, on the opioid agonist therapy effect. So in 2017, Cochrane published a systematic review of studies that looked at the effects of OAT on hepatitis C incidents that included our study with 11 other studies from North America, Europe, and Australia. As you can see, all the studies had strikingly similar findings demonstrating benefits in reducing incidence of hepatitis C. So the Cochrane Review concluded that OAT reduces the risk of hepatitis C acquisition by 50%. And this was based on those 12 observational studies, but no randomized control trials, and therefore they still um, had the caveat that the quality of evidence was low. We published a subsequent study suggesting that there might be an attenuated effect in females compared to males. So in considering the economic implications, I would like to point out that the cost of treating OUD is relatively inexpensive compared to treating hepatitis C. So both methadone and buprenorphine are priced at about $6,000 for a year of treatment. In contrast, the, quote, sticker cost for tre treating hepatitis C with sofosavir-based regimen is, uh, is about $84,000, although those uh, numbers have come down. It's also worth keeping in mind the additional cost savings that occurs with opioid use disorder treatment in preventing overdose, injury, and other infectious complications such, such as osteomyelitis, endocarditis, et cetera. So when framing this, I think it becomes obvious that opioid use disorder treatment is a worthwhile investment. But I don't want to downplay the importance of new medications for hepatitis C. So now we'll shift gears to talk about the revolution in hepatitis C treatment. The emergence of direct-acting direct antivirals, or DAAs, has radically changed the hepatitis C treatment paradigm. Sofosavir was the first DAA to come on the scene in 2013, but now there are multiple regimens, including medications that treat all genotypes. So we are now at a point where nearly all patients can be cured of hepatitis C with merely eight to 12 weeks of oral medications with few side effects. So this is a slide showing how radically different treatment today looks compared to the interferon era, where patients had to take weekly shots in addition to daily pills, side effects were the norm, and then there was only a 50-50 chance of getting cured. So you may or may not be aware that in the fall of 2018, Governor Jay Inslee announced a statewide initiative to eliminate hepatitis C. So here's a photo of him 
on Mayling 7th floor in the liver clinic at Harborview with a Harborview patient. The name of the initiative is Hep C Free Washington. But this is not just a statewide goal, as WHO has also announced the same ambitious goal of achieving hepatitis C elimination by 2030. So there's overwhelming consensus that treating active people who inject drugs is essential for achieving this goal. <clears throat> treating the baby boomer generation is the most effective strategy for reducing immediate complications related to hepatitis C, such as cirrhosis and liver cancer and related healthcare costs. But for reducing incidence and prevalence, we must focus on treating the individuals who are responsible for forward transmission. So this concept of treating infected individuals to reduce incidence of new infections over time, i.e. treatment as prevention, is something we saw proven for HIV. This slide shows data from our colleagues in Vancouver, Canada. The red line depicts the number of patients with HIV who were placed on ART, while the blue line shows the number of new HIV diagnoses. And as you can see, new infection rate is inversely proportional to increased numbers on ART. So it is believed that treatment as prevention should also apply for hepatitis C. The rationale being that DA cure rates among people who inject drugs appear to be nearly equivalent to non-PWID, and reinfection is thought to be a relatively rare occurrence which in theory can be prevented with OIT and syringe service programs. Admittedly, more real-world data is needed to establish rates of reinfection in the DA era and to demonstrate treatment as prevention for this disease. So the current guidelines uh, from the American Association of Study of Liver Diseases and the Infectious Disease Society of America are very clear that all patients with chronic hepatitis C should be treated, and they even state that scale-up of hepatitis C treatment in persons who inject drugs is necessary to positively impact the hepatitis C ep epidemic in the U.S. and globally. So just how much scale-up is needed? This slide shows data from a modeling study that looked at how differing rates of treatment among PWID would impact future prevalence. What I'd like you to appreciate is that even small differences in the numbers treated, say going from 20 to 40 persons per 1,000 treated, has a relatively large impact on future prevalence. <clears throat> so even extending treatment to small numbers of persons who inject drugs can make a large difference for future prevalence. So I hope I've convinced you that there are highly efficacious medications that can impact the, the concurrent epidemics of opioid use disorder and hepatitis C. But the question is, are patients who are eligible for these medications receiving them? My colleague Sarah Glick and I conducted a study to examine the prevalence of reporting treatment with OAT, so either methadone or buprenorphine, among people who inject drugs in the Seattle metropolitan area. So the study used 2015 data from the National HIV Behavioral Surveillance System, which is conducted annually, and every three years it is focused on adult uh, persons who inject drugs. Because the national survey asked only about any treatment for addiction in the past 12 months, and did not specify, we added questions to the local survey that asked specifically about use of buprenorphine or methadone within the past 12 months. So the sample was comprised of 487 persons who injected drugs who reported opioid use. Of those, uh, of those the vast majority, as you can see, 70% uh, reported no past year treatment with either methadone or buprenorphine, speaking to major treatment gaps. The treatment that was more frequently reported was methadone. 27% reported past year treatment. 
less than 5% reported past year buprenorphine treatment, and near, uh, twice as many reported that they had tried to get buprenorphine treatment but were unable, speaking to barriers. We used the same tw uh, 2015 and HBS data set to explore access to treatment for hepatitis C medications among people who inject drugs. So this is what we found the uh, care cascade look like for hepatitis C among these Seattle area persons who inject drugs. Starting with a sample of 338 who were hepatitis C antibody positive, we found that the majority of them reported having been previously screened, and most were aware of their diagnosis, which is the good news. The bad news is that only 7% reported ever having completed treatment, speaking to major gaps in hepatitis C treatment in this group. It is, of course, important to note that the data from this study were collected in 2015, so only two years after the arrival of the first DAs. Data from 2018 are currently being analyzed, and it will be interesting to see how this has changed in the past three years. So the results I just showed you were for active persons who injected drugs, majority who were probably not engaged in care or in addiction treatment. So you might wonder if the cascade would look different for persons who are actively engaged in addiction treatment and primary care. So we did a study also to map out the hepatitis C care cascade among patients who were receiving buprenorphine treatment in a primary care setting at Boston Medical Center. And sadly, the care cascade does not look dramatically different. Many received testing, but few were treated. Only 2% of those with chronic infection uh, had initiated treatment. So next I'll talk about current programs that we have implemented to address opioid use disorder treatment gaps. But first we need to consider the reasons for these treatment gaps. We know that there are substantial barriers to opioid use disorder treatment, both on the provider and the patient side. To prescribe buprenorphine requires completing an eight-hour training and applying to, applying to the DEA for a special license. This in itself is unfortunately a barrier. Currently, there is federal legislation pending that could remove this requirement, but for now, the requirement exists. Historically, only physicians could prescribe buprenorphine, although uh, that has changed now to allow nurse practitioners and physician assistants to prescribe. There's been a lack of training of medical students and residents to prescribe. In addition, the stigma of opioid use disorder makes some physicians disinclined to take on caring for this patient population. So even well-intentioned providers who do get waivers often do not prescribe or do not prescribe to their full capacity. Studies have looked at reasons why, and physicians lack, uh, cite a lack of time and clinic infrastructure support, as well as fear of medication diversion as a barrier. So in January 2016, prior to fully implementing our office-based buprenorphine program at Harborview, we conducted a survey to assess interest in prescribing buprenorphine among providers in our adult medicine clinic. We surveyed 27 residents and 17 attendings and found that the majority, 89%, did not have waivers at that time to prescribe, but that many, 67%, had high interest in prescribing. Younger age and belief in buprenorphine effectiveness were significantly associated with a higher interest in prescribing, speaking to the need to train young doctors. In response, we started providing waiver training to medical residents, and just last year, we received a grant from SAMHSA to support medical student and resident training. The goals of this grant are to train at least 
50 medical students and 50 residents per year with the hope that the majority will go on to obtain waivers and prescribe. So I'm very pleased to say we just completed the trainings for the medical students uh, a couple weeks ago, and we surpassed our goal with 60 <coughs> medical students who, who uh, received the training. And those students were bound for many different residencies around the country, as you can see from the pie graph. Through pre and post surveys, we found that uh, student confidence increased from 21% to 90% with the training, and nearly all the students plan to obtain a waiver in their residency. Um, however, we will continue to track them to see if they actually follow through and do prescribe. Next, I'd like to tell you a little bit about our buprenorphine program <coughs> that we implemented at Harborview in the Adult Medicine Clinic. And I'll share with you some outcomes of our program. We partnered with the state and Evergreen Treatment Services to receive a grant from SAMHSA to implement a collaborative care model for office-based buprenorphine treatment uh, at Harborview. As you recall, a major barrier cited by providers is lack of time and clinic support. So we adopted a collaborative care model that uses a nurse care manager as the center of clinical activities, um, which was developed at Boston Medical Center. We've had uh, good success with that model, and um, since the grant ended, uh, Joe Merrill has acquired new SAMHSA funding to expand this program beyond Adult Medicine Clinic and Harborview. For those of you who might be interested in more description about the Massachusetts Collaborative Care Model and other models of delivery of care for opioid use disorder, I'll refer you to this article that was published in the Annals of Internal Medicine in 2016, um, which describes the models in detail. This slide shows substance use outcomes of 422 patients who were treated with buprenorphine through the Matt Padoa program from 2015 to 2017. The slide compares uh, past 30 days substance use at baseline and six months later among patients. And as you can see, there are impressive declines in the use of opioids and even other non-opioid drugs in the treated sample. Any opioid uh, use went down by 73%, and even methamphetamine use went down by 56%. Furthermore, there were significant differences in acute healthcare utilization. At six months, the percentage of patients reporting an emergency department visit or hospitalization in the past 30 days went down, and those differences between baseline and six months were significant. Unsurprisingly, outpatient treatment went up since this care is offered in outpatient setting, and we also hope that by engaging patients in opioid use disorder, they may address other health issues such as hepatitis C. In addition to provider-related barriers to opioid use disorder treatment, we must acknowledge patient-level barriers. So one such barrier is that most patients with substance use disorders do not perceive uh, their use disorder and do not seek treatment. As a result, it becomes critical to offer opioid use disorder medications in medical contexts where patients with opioid use disorder are being seen, but where treatment has not historically been offered. So two such examples are offering treatment in the emergency department and the hospital inpatient setting. So studies have shown benefits of offering buprenorphine in both settings. We are currently um, uh, part of a NIDA CTN study that is looking at uh, practice facilitation to encourage ED physicians to prescribe buprenorphine. And I believe my colleague, Lauren Whiteside, came and spoke to you about that in Grand Rounds a few weeks ago. 
We are now also offering buprenorphine to patients who are hospitalized with opioid use disorder through our addiction medicine consult service. As this has previously been shown to be efficacious in a study that I was involved with at Boston Medical Center. So just to briefly review the results of that study, we recruited hospitalized patients with opioid use disorder, either heroin or prescription opioids, who were not already engaged in addiction treatment. So the study randomized patients either to a linkage arm, which was induction with buprenorphine followed by a prescription to bridge to an outpatient um, office-based opioid treatment program appointment. And that was compared to a detoxification arm where there was induction of buprenorphine in the hospital to manage acute withdrawal, followed by a taper over five days. So the study enrolled 139 subjects and there was a six month follow up. Patients in the linkage arm uh, were, versus the detox arm were found to be more likely to enter outpatient treatment, 72 versus 12%. They were found to be more likely to be retained at six months, although I'll point out the retention rates were very poor, 17 versus 3%. However, even with such poor retention rates, the linkage arm was much less likely to be using illicit opioids at six months compared to the um, detox arm. So as I've alluded to, another um, <clears throat> patient factor which explains the medication treatment gap is the fact that retention uh, and adherence to medications are suboptimal. So in general, the studies demonstrate that retention is slightly better for methadone compared to buprenorphine. And we saw this in our study that I showed you earlier that looked at Seattle area persons who inject drugs. So among those who reported having re received treatment within the tw last 12 months, we asked them how long they had been on treatment for. And as you can see, patients who reported being treated with methadone, the majority of them said that they were on treatment for more than six months, which is good, which is maintenance therapy. However, it was the opposite for patients who reported being treated with buprenorphine. The majority said that they'd only been treated for three months or less. So studies suggest that non-adherence to buprenorphine is quite common with uh, perhaps 30% of doses not being taken. And typically 50% of patients will drop out of treatment by one year. So this is data from our Matt Padoa program. And unfortunately, as you can see, we are just average in this respect. So most patients drop out early within the first few months, um, and by one year, only about half remain in treatment. So clearly there's room for major improvement here. So in the remaining time I have, I'd like to tell you about a couple of ongoing research studies that are testing novel healthcare interventions to improve adherence and outcomes for patients with opioid use disorder and hepatitis C. The first is the HERO study, which stands for Hepatitis C Real Options. So this is an eight-site PCORI funded study that is testing models of care for treating active persons who inject drugs for hepatitis C. The study enrolled over 600 patients who were current injectors and treated them with standard FDA-approved uh, medications, namely Sofosbuvir or Vopatosphere, for 12 weeks. Patients were enrolled both from the methadone clinic and community health center settings. And they were randomized to either a, a receiving a patient navigator or to have a directly observed therapy. The study uh, is looking at the outcomes that are listed here with um, sustained virologic response at 12 weeks, which is um, standard for cure, being the primary outcome of interest. But in addition, we're following patients for up to two years to look for reinfection. So this is a schematic of the study design and just a little bit more about the interventions. Uh, for the patient navigation, we used a protocol called Check Hep C that was developed by the New York City Department of Public Health. The directly observed therapy arm consisted of receiving hepatitis C medications uh, directly with uh, methadone for those who were recruited from the methadone clinics, or confirming ingestion through a smartphone app that allowed video confirmation uh, for patients who were enrolled from the community sites. 
So we had um, many partners for this study. The Hepatitis Education Project, which provided patient navigators, and Evergreen Treatment Services, which was our methadone clinic enrollment site. So I would like to add as a necessary prerequis prerequisite for the study, we had to be able to offer hepatitis C treatment on site at ETS. And I'd like to acknowledge um, Lisa Chu, who was extremely instrumental in starting up a Harborview Adult Medicine Clinic satellite um, site at Evergreen Treatment Services which allowed for two primary care providers, myself and Dr. James, who are trained in hepatitis C treatment, to be there two half days a week. So that satellite clinic has been extremely well received and continues to operate um, at this time. And if I had more time, I would have liked to have shared outcomes about that program as well. This slide uh, shows that we've met our enrollment targets both nationally and here in Seattle. And I'm pleased to say we were one of the first sites to, um, to meet our enrollment target. The data have not yet been analyzed, so I can't present that today. However, I'd like to leave you with some quotes from participants who have consented to share this information. So one participant said, the research study was extremely easy to fit into my life. Keeping in contact with HERO and HEP was the main thing that kept me going. There was not one second where I thought I didn't want to take the medication. Another patient participant said, I actually feel being cured. It's a different stride in your step. Before I felt sluggish, and now I don't. I feel a lot better. So through the HERO study, I was introduced to the smartphone app for video directly observed therapy. And I thought this could have good utility for patients who are treated with buprenorphine as well. So I coupled with the company um, and wrote a grant to NIDA, which was funded, which allows us to develop and test the app for buprenorphine treatment. So we just completed phase one, a qualitative study and a pilot feasibility study, which I'll share with you. So our qualitative study was just recently published, um, and the title is Provider and Patient Perspectives on Barriers to Buprenorphine Adherence and the Acceptability of Video Drug Leads or Therapy to Enhance Adherence. And I'll just um, give you a few quotes um, from that study. Here's one patient talking about adherence. Sometimes I have forgotten in the afternoon when you're busy and not really thinking about it. There's been times that I've just said throughout the day, hey, I forgot to take my Suboxone. But another patient said, and again, these are the patient's own words, it's just because as addicts, whether everyone else wants to admit it or not, we like to get high. And taking the medicine, we can't get high if we're taking it like we should. That's why I wouldn't want to take it all the time. So this patient um, had this to share about uh, video directly observed therapy. The Suboxone program in general relies a lot on trust and communication between the patient and provider or providers, you know. So I think that video directly observed therapy would be good. Everybody could be on the same page. They feel good about it, especially when you're changing doses or have maybe had problems in the past staying on the program. I think it would be good, it would help to hold people accountable. So we also uh, completed a small feasibility study of 14 subjects who use the app for four weeks. And we were pleased to find that all participants but one were able to successfully use the app and upload videos. 10 out of 14 participants reported that they were satisfied or very satisfied using the app. Two out of 14 were neutral, none were dissatisfied, which I was pleased to see. For those using the app, daily buprenorphine treatment was confirmed through videos most of the time. So the results suggested that use of a smartphone app to allow at-home video directly observed therapy of buprenorphine treatment is both feasible and acceptable. So we're moving now to phase two and uh, starting a two-site randomized control trial at both Herberview and Boston Medical Center, and we expect to enroll 80 participants and randomize them to either uh, DOT or treatment as usual. And the outcomes of interest will be the percentage of weekly urine drug tests that are positive for opioids and retention in treatment. So in summary, in conclusion in my talk, 
that I'd like us to appreciate that the epidemics of opioid use disorder and hepatitis C virus are closely intertwined. Elimination of hepatitis C is a state, national, and global priority, and it requires treating persons who inject drugs. Efficacious medications exist for both opioid use disorder and hepatitis C, and yet are underutilized by patients who need them. Numerous programs have been developed at UW and Harborview to address opioid use disorder and hepatitis C treatment gaps. And ongoing research is testing whether an mHealth intervention for video DOT can improve outcomes. I'd like to acknowledge my community partners, also the wonderful patient participants, uh, the office-based opioid treatment team, which is much bigger than this. Um, I want to acknowledge all my UW collaborators. Um, there are a lot of them. <coughs> and especially my research teams for the HERO and the TAB study, and particularly Andrea Raddick, who helped me prepare these slides today. So um, I guess I'll be taking questions in person. <laughs> Is that right? Yeah. Uh. We thank you very much. It's, uh, <laughs> afterwards and talk with Judith, so I appreciate it. I appreciate everybody staying for this awards presentation. Uh, several years ago, under the uh, direction of Dr. Bremner, uh, when he was chairman of the department, we established an award for outstanding medical students. Uh, in internal medicine that recognized uh, outstanding performance and potential in the field of internal medicine as demonstrated through their third year medicine clerkship as well as sub-internships. And so the, pro the program has been going on for several years. This year we have uh, two recipients of the Outstanding uh, Internal Medical Student Award and I'd like to uh, have those two folks come up. Um, I will start with uh, introducing uh, uh, soon to be Dr. Uh, Mindy Zaitz Chua and read some comments here. Mindy was an exceptional student uh, in the internal medicine clerkship. She displayed such a comprehensive understanding of her patients, clinicals, her patients clinical picture and, her, and plans were well thought out and detailed. Her presentations were delivered with con confidence. Her patients respected her and thought of her as their doctor. They always, she always went above and beyond, always checking in with them throughout the day. Mindy is such a joy to work with. She broke down even our, our grumpiest of patients with her cheerful demeanor and her gentle questions, which came in very useful and uh, great ways at, at bringing out difficult histories. Her knowledge and thoroughness was excellent and she came in w into work every day with a remarkable attitude. Mindy. Our uh, uh, second outstanding medical student award is uh, gonna go to Sarah Bernards. Sarah's performance was excellent. She was performing at the level of an early intern, surpassing even what I would expect from a sub-I. She was managing patients independently with presentations that demonstrated excellent clinical knowledge and synthesis of, complete, of complex problems, even in the complicated UW patients. She frequently went to uh, primary resources to look up answers, evidence for clinical questions, and was active in sharing her readings with the team. She even had a, gave a great talk on polypharmacy with a summary sheet. Sarah has an excellent bedside manner and great rapport with patients, with one particularly carmogeny patient that the team depended on her as the primary contact because she was the one who was able to align our goals with his. She was very caring and the patients missed her when she went off service. Clearly a superb student who will be an excellent internal medicine doc in the future. Thank you all so much for staying for the awards presentation.